So welcome to our show, Con uh, Constitutional Chats. This is Economy 101. You see, I get to create all these sort of dream series that we do. The last one was on the court system. So if I don't really understand everything thoroughly, I just get to create a series on the show and we get to do it. And I get to feel so smart afterwards. And so now we have the whole series. Everyone can check it out at constitutionamerica.org. It's going to be eight or nine shows on the economy. But today is Economy 101. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And you can talk to us. I know you have some graphs that look really confusing to me because I'm not an economist, but that's why I am excited to hear. Uh, you're going to break it down for us in a way that we can really understand. <laughs> all right, John Cochran, hello. And all of that in seven minutes. So it's a yeah, pleasure exactly. to be here. And uh, let's, let's start it right in with Economics uh, 101, um, especially when we think about the Constitution. Uh, the most important fact about economics is long-term economic growth. <clears throat> when our, our uh, founding uh, fathers and mothers were in charge of setting this country up in 1775 on my graph, um, the average person earned in today's dollars around $2,000. Now that's about $60,000. Uh, that is just amazing. You're seeing here a plot <clears throat> of, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> GDP per capita, which is the same thing as income per capita over time. And that's a vast understatement of how much better off we are than our great, 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 great grandfathers and, and grandmothers. Um, George Washington died of a, a simple infection that could have been, uh, you know, uh, easily cured. Uh, going back in time with 50,000 bucks in your pocket when everyone else has 2,000 vastly understates how much better off every American is now. Than was at the time. And this has only started then. This capped off 10,000 years of misery uh, with no growth whatsoever. That is the most, the only important economic uh, feature of uh, the economic question. Long run economic growth, can we keep it going? Can we keep this amazing rise in our prosperity going? You notice in my graph, little blips. Those are the recessions. As an example of nothing else matters, we get very excited about recessions. There's the Great Depression, that was a terrible time, but it came back. Here, these little blips here are all the recessions after uh, after World War II. There's this is the Great Recession of 2008. Yeah, they hurt. They're not so great, but compared to long run growth, that's tiny. Everything else we're fighting about in Washington: uh, who's going to pay for your child care? Um, you know, who's uh, do unions or whatever help? That's just nothing compared to this enormous long run growth. That is, you want Econ 101? That is the number one question, more, more important than anything else. Now, not just growing over time, let's look across countries. Not all countries have shared in this amazing growth in our prosperity. I mean, literally, our, our each you look back enough, every single one of us, our grandparents, great parents, whatever, were hoeing the earth by hand to try and scratch out a living and not starve and, and dying of easily preventable diseases, and we are not. You look across the world, a lot of places still are like that. So this graph here, I have in 2018 income per capita. It's on a log scale, so it gets squished. We start at 320 and go up to $100,000. And you can see not all countries are as wonderfully well off as there's the USA. Uh, China, people talk a lot about China. It's still, we're at $60,000. China's at $10,000. Now they're in the news because they've grown like crazy. They went from 300 to 10,000 very quickly but they are still uh, one seventh of our prosperity on a per capita basis. India, about $2,000. Uh, the Central African Republic, I, I picked out not to pick on them, but because when I first started doing this, it was the worst in the world at $320. The standard of living across the world is just enormously variable because a lot of these countries haven't really, haven't started, haven't really fully embraced that growth miracle. Now, the x-axis on this graph is the ease of doing business index. It's a simple measure of, can you start a business? Do you have to pay bri bribes? Uh, how, how hard is it to just run average businesses? And it, it runs, it's a scale from uh, the best possible observed in the world anywhere is, would be 100. Even the US is only 82 on the ease of doing business scale. But you can see the dramatic correlation <clears throat> between ease of doing business and this prosperity which summarizes in one graph uh, what modern growth theory will tell us. Where does this golden goose of growth come from? Uh, it comes from property rights, <clears throat> rule of law, the freedom to innovate and challenge existing business, the freedom of Uber to come in and unseat the taxi monopolies and, and serve you and me better. <clears throat> That's where growth comes from. Uh, 
The graph also shows you, it's truly amazing. Now, you know that there's good governments and bad governments, good laws and bad laws, but the damage that bad governments can do is really amazing. You, you know, the, the differences between $1,000 and $60,000, what is different about these countries? Well, what's different is the laws and public policies uh, the, in, uh, that, they, that they live under. And 82 to 100, even the US could be a lot better. So the golden goose of growth, she, she, she needs tending. As a great example, uh, this is North versus South Korea at night. South Korea is down here, North Korea is up there. No, there wasn't a snowstorm in North Korea. It's like that every night. <laughs> Providence has given us amazing controlled experiments. Uh, North Korea versus South Korea, East Germany versus West Germany, Venezuela, Cuba. If you want it, it's just amazing that bad governments can do so much damage to their economies. and. By, by implication, better governments can keep this growth going and make our grandchildren as much better off than we are, as we are than George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. The bad news here is that growth is slowing down. <clears throat> now this graph is on a log scale. Notice things get squished as you go up. And the way a log scale works is that if it's growing at a, along a straight line, that's a steady growth rate. So this is about a 4% annual growth rate shows up as a straight line in the graph. And you see from 1950 <clears throat> to 2000, the steady growth in the US economy. By the way, <clears throat> growth is not just about 1770s to now. In 1950, a lot of commentators, oh, the wonderful economy of the 1950s when everything was great. No, back in the 1950s, the average American had $16,000 of real income in constant dollars. Today, that's $60,000. We're dramatically better off than we were even in the 1950s. And you know, we have also clean, cleaner air, all sorts of things are better than the 1950s. But that golden goose of growth is slowing down. The red line I drew in kind of impressionistic trend line, you can see in 2000, things start slowing down. The great uh, recession of 2008, growth afterwards never caught up and kept going slow. There's our COVID recession, we're back, kind of back to it. But we are 20, $30,000 a person below where we should be. What's wrong, America? Why is the golden goose laying eggs much more slowly than she used to be? Well, we're supposed to talk about the Constitution. And <clears throat> Constitution, what, you know, our laws, our system of laws is what makes this country, this economic prosperity, this undreamed of by our founders' economic prosperity so good. Yet when you look at economic law and regulation, almost all economic law and regulation is there to protect some interest to take some money to A and give it to B, to, to, you know, to bend the scales towards the tenant at expense of the landlord, uh, to help the union member at expense of the other people, to help the domestic producer at expense of the foreign producer. And all of that protecting some interest retards growth. What keeps the golden goose alive? Well, you would think the constitution, right? We're in a constitutional system. Uh, does though the constitution protect economic liberty? Our constitution was set up by people who had no clue that this growth was there or was possible. And in fact, constitutional scholarship has gone back and forth on the question of, does the constitution protect your economic liberty? Do you have the right to buy things or sell things at the price you choose, at the terms you want, to hire people or to fire people, to work for people who you want to work for on the terms you like, to sign contracts, the right to start businesses, <clears throat> the right to own property, and to do with that property what you want. Uh, in my town of Palo Alto, if I want to cut down a tree on my property, I'm not allowed to do that. If I want to put up an apartment building, I'm not allowed to do that because there's uh, zoning laws. Do you have the right to borrow or to lend to somebody else or to invest as you please, or as the Securities and Exchange Commission demands that you do? Do you have, this is coming up with cryptocurrencies, do you have the right to transact anonymously? To, 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 to spend money on what you'd like without the federal government knowing about it? Hmm, good questions. <laughs> Those rights, now the constitution is about the federal government. There are two kinds of rights in the constitution. There are general rights, uh, like the Bill of Rights, an individual right against all government, or uh, there's another set of rights that, that limits the federal government from intervening in things that state governments can intervene in. There are things like that, for example, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution 
uh, prohibits individual states from setting up tariffs against other states. There is a defense of liber economic liberty in the Constitution. You have the right to travel. We don't have border controls across states. There is a right to economic liberty in the Constitution. The 14th Amendment gives you the right to quit any job you'd like. You can't be held to a labor contract. There are some rights. So there are some rights in the Constitution. Uh, there are these are economic uh, um, legislation, economic rules. Uh, do they have to be laws? Can administrative agencies simply say, uh, I, the agency, form a rule that says in order to sell salt, you have to have a certain salt permit? Uh, you know, can, can a federal rule be uh, put in place for that? Can an agency simply issue proclamations, as they increasingly do, about what you're allowed to do? Can the executive order, can the president simply say, no, you may not build a pipeline by executive order? <clears throat> are you allowed to do that? So those are the deep constitutional questions. Clearly, our economic liberties are what give us this golden goose of growth. There's a natural tendency for government, uh, for the tyranny of government that our founders worried about, to try and use that power to take what you have and give it to concentrated economic powers. And we have a system of laws, constitutions, traditions of property rights, rules and law to try to defend your rights and to keep uh, growth going. But is that in the Constitution? That is, I think, the big debate that we had once between the 1890s and the 1940s, and I think it is time for us to have that again. I'll, I'll mention one, Wickard v. Filburn. If you want to learn one case and you're an economist, that's the case to learn. Wickard was a farmer, and in the 1930s, when the federal government wanted to run agriculture, tell you how much you could grow and what you could sell it for, Wickard grew some wheat on his own land, used it to feed his own animals and to bake his own bread. But he did not have a federal marketing order to do it. They took him to court and fined him. Wickard said, no, under interstate commerce, the federal government has no right to tell me that I cannot grow wheat on my own land to bake my own bread and feed my own animals. He lost. <laughs> the federal government now has <clears throat> that right. And even if it did not, uh, the case there was only about federal power. State governments have under general police power the right to tell you, you may not grow wheat on your own land to feed your own horses. Well, maybe we need to take those back. So the Constitution is a, is a wonderful uh, device. It was there to, to, it is created to defend our liberties against the encroachments of tyranny and government, but it is not specifically designed for economic liberties and the great conversation we are having, and I think need to have in, in the decline of growth era is, is uh, whether the Constitution uh, and our system of law should allow us the defense of economic liberties as we have with personal and, and other kinds of liberties. Okay, thank you. That's enough for slides. Let's chat. Okay, that was great. I'm taking notes. <laughs> I have my list of notes. Um, wow. Okay, so you're ready? You're ready for questions. That's what you said, correct? Yes, John? Yes, yes. I raised lots okay. of questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, my last question, I, I have questions on the earlier graphs, uh, but I definitely get to my last two questions. So we'll do a lightning round because see, I have to make sure as the sort of, what am I, uh, the keeper of the clock that well, Tova well, and Julie, Jordan and Kathy all have their time. So I can't well, hog. Clarifying questions on the graphs are fine and I can put them back up again if you'd like that to. That way I want to, yeah, okay. So go back to the first graph and we'll do these uh, lightning round answers till I get to my last two. Um, Albert, will put that $10,000 of no growth. Let's see, why did I write that down? Let's go back to the very, is that the first one? There's the first graph for you. Okay, I wrote down $10,000 $10, of no growth. So why did I write that down? Um, you said, what is this? This is per capita. Oh, in the 1950s. So is, is this, um, oh, it was talking about, not, oh, go back up to the top one, uh, Aubrey, or who's doing that? Okay, yeah, here we go. So this one here. So uh, this is 1775, um, and is are these numbers accounted for for inflation? Yes. Okay, so that that was my, my as, first. as best we can. Now, the, the hard thing to account for is they didn't have iPhones in 1775. <laughs> no matter right. how rich you were in 1775, you wanted to get from Philadelphia to Boston, you had to walk. Uh, so yeah. in some sense, it's a tremendous understatement of how much better off we are. But this is the what economists, the best economists can do about sort of what's 
in as much as we can adjust for inflation and, and real terms and quality of goods and services, what's the average income of a person in the US now as it relative to 1775, about 2000, 1950, mm -hmm. about 16,000. Uh, it's just amazing how much better off we've got. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting that, that we think the 50s was so prosperous and yet I think in so many different ways the well, people, there's a common people look often. Here's economics 101. Economics is all about mistakes. One mistake is to look at growth rates rather than overall levels. The 1950s was a period of look at that 50s and 60s, very strong growth. It was rising a lot, but it's much better off to be at a high level than it is to be poor and rising. That's why China, everyone talks about China. China is growing quickly, but it's growing quickly from a base of abject poverty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't, mistake, it'll, it'll don't mistake levels and growths. Econ 101, don't mistake levels and growth. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know I did a movie in Hong Kong in 1985, and they, of course, England gave it back to Hong Kong in 1997, I believe. And but they were very worried even 1984 about what was going to happen and if the communists were going to take over. And so I think they're in dire straits. I think they just shut down a, a free newspaper in Hong Kong because they were afraid of political consequences. So things are getting ready to get pretty dire in Hong Kong. The only reason I bring up Hong Kong is because Hong Kong is such an economic powerhouse um, or was. OK, so this is adjusted for inflation. Um, and, and you, you put it, I, you put it into place here. In other words, how much more it costs for a dinner now than it did then. I mean, it's all equalized, I guess, no matter what money you made, if you had to pay for a pot pie at the local tavern, it's equalized in assessment. Yes. That's the best we can. Okay. Okay. Good. So remember um, 1775, almost all Americans lived on farms. Yeah, uh, and what the, the and what they did with their lives was to plow behind horses, and try to grow enough stuff to eat, and maybe a little bit they could take to market to buy manufactured goods that came from England in sailing ships and were, were made out of wood. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was yeah. a hard life. So any way right. you measure it, and in 1950, you know, think about how Americans lived in the 1950s. Uh, they lived in small houses. They had one car that fell apart in about a year. They had maybe one radio, a black and white TV, uh, health care that didn't know how to cure anything. Um, you know, there's, there's this improvement in quality of life. Well, uh, well the, the, the longevity of life. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, it was more like you died around 60 or something. And now people are living to be 80. It's That's really changed. And that's well. not even in here. <laughs> yeah, we're not even Clean air. Long yeah. life, uh, you know, all the many uh, that all adds to this. So growth. Well, and I think it's like important, the important what's, issue. What's important that you touched on, and I guess I'll focus on this now, is in the Constitution. It, it, in order for this free competition, and even Biden was talking about that yesterday with the beef prices, and the, it sounds so alternative in in nature. He sounded more like a Republican than a than a liberal, so to speak. But he was saying as in with the, and I don't know if this is correct or not, because uh, I'm a rancher, I have cattle and horses, and I heard a counteracting where the, the rancher was saying that the beef prices are up, but we're not getting more for our cattle. And that I really understand because, you know, I raise cattle and I'm supposed to sell them. And <laughs> sometimes I do. Uh, but the amount of, you know, what you're making for the for, for cattle is that that's not going up at the same time as beef prices. But what Biden was saying is that there's no freedom of competition. I don't know if that's true or not, but he was talking about freedom of competition and that keeps prices down. And I think that that's what that's very uh, economy 101. Is it not that when you have uh, a capitalist society as opposed to a communist society or even a socialist society, we're able to have competition. And, and I think that even happened in our are uh, you keep talking about healthcare? Uh, the 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 Mercs and the Pfizer's and the Modernas and all these different people. Their their ability of a competition um, not only brings us faster health and better health, it also brings lower prices. So all of that's very important as far as competition in the marketplace, is it not? Competition is absolutely vital to everything. Uh, it's the competition from new companies unseating old companies that gives you uh, innovation. Uh, uh, now, uh, it is not true that our current inflation is coming from sudden greed among collusive 
uh, 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 farmers Mark. who are getting together to rise the price of beef. That's just simply false. So why is if that? you're worried happen? about competition, why would you slap a 25% tariff on lumber just as it's, uh, just as it's uh, grown, uh, what is it, 200% in the last couple of months? Almost all monopolies are granted by the federal government and imposed by the federal government. And even so, look at this graph. <laughs> uh, there might be monopolies here and there. We worry a lot about somebody, somebody raising prices and you know something's 20% higher than it should be. Just none of that makes a dent in, in growing at this uh, relative to this rate. So we're that's like fighting about the size of the pie, fighting about who gets the pie versus the size of it. And, and just doubling the size of the pie. Uh, that's yeah. the important part. So people are not able to, the beef, beef prices are higher because the government's taxing the, the beef or doing something with the beef is what they're doing with lumber. Because I know the real estate market's very, very productive in Texas. And now they, they can't even build their houses because they can't get lumber. Is that because of a tariff? Is that what's happening? Uh, all prices are high right now because we're having a classic little bit of inflation. <clears throat> the government printed up about $5 trillion of money and handed it out in checks. Next thing you get, inflation. So, <laughs> yeah, money's not worth not money's a big worth mystery. What it be. Why we're yeah, getting just, the interesting thing is that we're getting out of Washington all of the same excuses that we heard in the 1970s. Oh, there's a supply shock. Oh, the greedy people are raising the prices. Oh, this, that, and the other thing. No, they printed up money, they handed it out. You get inflation. That's uh, just a classic. Yeah, and for those who don't know what inflation is, that's when the money. There's so much money, it's not worth what it used to be. Hey. Quickly, and I want to move on to my last question. What do you think about the gold system? I mean, Nixon, correct? It was during the Nixon administration that we went off the gold standard. Did that help us or hurt us in the long run? Uh, the gold standard had some wonderful uh, features of it, a commitment to not having inflation over long time periods, but it's not a monetary system that can work uh, today because uh, it, what it gives you is stable prices over very long periods of time, but lots of sharp up and down inflation uh, in the meantime. So the gold standard is is not uh, for today's economy. And, and when I come back, maybe we'll do uh, <clears throat> economics 102 <laughs> on yeah. money and inflation and price levels. But I spend my life, my professional life, I spend thinking about money and inflation. My next book is the fiscal theory of the price level on where does inflation come from. But inflation was bad in the 1970s. Inflation is better in the 1980s. Uh, inflation has been up into the gold standard was in the 1930s up through 1972. You cannot see in this plot of what really matters inflation coming and going. So inflation's bad. Uh, like all little things, it's it's bad. It's chaos for the economy, but it is second order compared to the supply side of the economy compared to getting this engine of growth going again. Okay, last question because I want to toss it over. Um, I am very interested in, I had a lot of questions on the other slides, but I'm going to go on down to Wickard versus Filburn. I have a ranch and, and I find it really, and then also I think I have two, two questions for you. What is, you said our constitution isn't really geared toward economy. So I would like to know well, how you think that what should be in the constitution. Let's say we were to do an amendment that would free the economy. That's one question I have for you. And the second is I'm very concerned about this Willard, ver, uh, Wickard versus Filburn. Uh, because are you saying that on my ranch, I have to have the approval to grow strawberries in my sandy soil in the, in the West 40? <laughs> um, I don't know. You know agricultural regulations more than I do today, but I do know that the, uh, the uh, yes, the strawberry market is controlled by the federal government uh, and uh, strawberry imports are from Mexico are limited by the federal government. That's a strong source of competition were it to be there. Uh, Wait, so let, let me go back. Let me go back. Agriculture let, and it's it's telling you what you can buy and sell and at what price. Let me go back, John. So I so I because because I really want to understand. In Wickard versus Filburn, he was told he could not grow wheat on his own property to feed himself without yes. regulation. Yes, the uh, federal in the part of the uh, the Roosevelt administration in the New Deal uh, programs had started a federal marketing order that they, their idea was the price of wheat is too low. The way we're going to stop this, <laughs> it's a great example, actually. Compet there's too much competition. The farmers are competing too much and driving the prices down. So we're going to tell the farmers to stop growing so much wheat, and that will help get wheat prices up. The heck with the poor consumer who kind of likes uh, low prices of wheat. But that's a great example of economic regulation that helps one category of person that forms a monopoly 
of farmers <clears throat> in order to help them at the expense of everybody else. Well, that, uh, so the federal, let me well. Think, I, the federal government about... said in order to grow wheat, you must have a federal marketing order for wheat. That was how it worked in the 1930s. <clears throat> and Wickard grew wheat, even though he didn't have a federal marketing order that allowed him to grow wheat. And so he was taken to court. Okay, so it, this doesn't necessarily apply to everything else, I guess. If you want a pecan tree to have pecans to eat, where, where this was just specific with wheat. That was the program in the 1930s. Now, we still have agricultural programs that limit acreage that you can uh, produce on things, that limit the prices that you can sell, the government buys stuff. So we have, a, we have an enormous government agricultural program. I don't believe the wheat marketing orders of the 1930s are still in, in, uh, in force. Okay, last question. You keep kind of parlaying this into selling it. Are you, but I, I want to go back. I, I want to go back to: Can he grow wheat to feed himself? He, he lost. Was, he may not. And in fact, that was affirmed by the Supreme Court recently. And I'm sad to say, Justice Scalia was the one who who wrote the uh, uh, opinion. A pot farmer uh, grew pot on his own land in order to smoke himself. Uh, went to the Supreme Court saying, "Let's overturn a uh, Wickard v. Filburn, you you conservatives." Uh, because who, how is the federal government allowed me to stop growing pot on my own farm for my own consumption? And Wickard v. Thilmer was affirmed and he went to jail. Okay, but that's pot, which is illegal. We well, are trying is the to federal sell. government allowed to make pot illegal? That's the kind of question. On your own land for your own consumption. That's an that's a interesting question of economic liberty. Okay, okay, so I'm going to move on now. But last time I'm going to ask you, because I find this just incredulous. On my ranch, I don't have the right to grow potatoes or zucchini and feed myself. If the federal government says you don't have the right, if they pass a rule saying there's a zucchini marketing order, they are allowed to do that and to stop you from growing your own zucchini to feed yourself. Yes. Under That's interstate really commerce. really bad. That's really bad. Because the logic was, well, by the, since you're growing it yourself, you won't be shopping for it in the grocery store and that might affect prices, which might affect interstate commerce. So under the very, the constitution limited, the federal government can only affect interstate commerce, but they ruled that that was enough interstate commerce. But there was nobody disagreed that state governments, you know, the Lochner decision, <laughs> 1890s, was about whether state governments had the right to do things like that. And uh, that was also in Lochner, it was decided no state governments can't tell you what to do. Uh, by the 1930s, that had changed as well. And state governments could tell you. But that's, tell that's just like communist society. That's just like Stalin, grow the potatoes and give them all to me. I mean, I don't even understand that. Okay. You know, that's a lot of, uh, this is why there's a lot of uh, free market scholarship that says we need to revisit the reinterpretation of the constitution and the commerce clause and our economic we're very, we're, the US has made enormous strides in personal liberties, but our economic liberties, uh, we've yeah. taken a lot of steps back. That's really, that's really mind boggling to me. It, it, that's just, okay. All right, I'm gonna stop talking, however, and turn it over to Tova. And let's take the graph down. There we go, we can go to Tova now. All right, Tova, you're on. Great, thank you. This is really fascinating and I'm honestly learning a lot. I had to do economics class all online last year. So I feel like this is filling in some gaps. Um, so I'm just interested in hearing your opinion. Um, you know, we've had a lot of growth in America and, and great increase in standards of living. But along with that, we've also had, especially in recent years, inequality, which I think a lot of people are worried about. Um, and that's a lot of people's concerns with that current economic system is equal, uh, inequality, economic inequality. So I'm curious, um, in your view, is that is that an issue or... Um, is that not as, or do we not need to be as concerned about that as we need to be about growth? So first of all, most of the facts on inequality that you are fed are wrong. <laughs> uh, they come, so for one, one example, a lot of the uh, studies studied inequality before taxes and transfers. <clears throat> so if we say you have more income than X, but we don't count the fact that you paid out half of that in taxes and X got from the federal government checks well, come on, that's kind of cheating, isn't it? <laughs> so the numbers are uh, um, lots of societies we compare it to also. So let's compare to inequality in Cuba. Cuba is totally equal society. We're all equally poor in some sense, uh -huh, except you're a party member. 
So things are given to party members, not, uh, not to everyone else. And so in fact, there's a lot more inequality there than in the United States. But if you say inequality is a problem, here's the fundamental issue. If you say inequality is a problem, then we are made better off if we take uh, half of Bill Gates's money and we take $100 away from you. We've become more equal, haven't we? So are we better off as a society if we lop off half of Bill Gates's money, throw it down a rat hole, and take $100 away from all the rest of us because we've become more equal? You don't think that makes sense, then you don't think inequality by itself is a problem. Hmm. In fact, how does some, you know, some poor kid in Fresno, there's a lot of poor, poor people around in this country and a lot of people with limited opportunities. If the average hedge fund manager only gets to fly a Gulfstream rather than a 747, how is their life made better off? It's not. I think under the, the guise of worrying about inequality, there's, there's a genuine thing that I think we can all agree on. There are barriers to opportunity in the United States. And I want to see people on the lower end of our income and social scale have much better opportunities. So let's stop talking about inequality. Let's talk about opportunity. Now we're talking about horrendous public schools in the thrall of teachers unions, which send kids out with fourth grade educations and now want to even ban the tests so we won't even know what we're doing to these kids. We'll talk about zoning laws that make it impossible to build apartments near where the jobs are and consign people to, to bad lives. There's, there's serious barriers to opportunity in the US. I think that there's a sentiment that worries about, that, uh, worries about inequality, that is worried about um, people stuck on the lower rungs of the economic, social, uh, and, and income ladder and uh, how to, what is sticking them there and how to get them out. I think that's a, a worthy feeling, but, but, but making the rich poorer and the poor a little bit poorer so that we're all more equal. Uh, turning back, if you will, the clock. If you think the 1950s were great, okay. You and I, instead of getting $60,000 a year, get $16,000 a year. And, and, and poor people, instead of getting $20,000 a year, get $10,000 a year. We'll, we'll cut us by, three quarters and then by half when we're all more equal and we'll breathe horrible dirty air and, and go back to the, the racial and gender inequalities of the 1950s. You think that's a great idea? Uh, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, also reducing inequality typically means we'll go to a society where the government hands out the benefits. So the way you get ahead is by pleading with the government as opposed to building a better product, working harder, getting ahead. We, we need a society, an opportunity society, a place where people can, can grow and, and, and do things. We don't need a society that the, 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 the dream of, we'll give every poor person a check from the government, a double wide trailer and free opiates is essentially the dream of the transfer economy. And I think that's just a horrible way to think of lives of poor people. So what you're talking about is kind of uh, equality of, of opportunity versus equality of outcome, correct? Absolutely. Great. Um, and then going back to the graphs, which I know everyone loves, um, on that chart plotting uh, average GDP versus uh, ease of doing business. So obviously the US is luckily on the higher end of both those scales, but it does appear there are some countries that are Higher than higher than us on average GDP and higher than us on ease of doing business. I was cur curious if you could identify which country those are, those are and and why they might have those differences and if we if you feel we should learn anything from them or if our system is good. Uh, I think our system is. Um, they, they say you know Winston Churchill. I don't know if he did or didn't save democracy. It's the worst of all systems except of all the other ones. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I view the U.S. as, as sharply overregulated, overlegislated, and and drowning in red tape, and that's why our growth is tailing off. But everybody else is worse. <laughs> now, most of these, I can't, I don't, I don't have the. Most of these are tiny little countries. Uh, the United Arab Emirates and Luxembourg might be up in there, and and you can see reasons why those might be uh, insanely rich in a way that isn't, uh, you know, a, a large country that isn't just sitting on a pot of oil like us can't. Uh, can't to do. Uh, there are countries now, it's interesting, some of the Nordic countries are better on ease of doing business than the United States. The United States, our, our constitution is, is lovely for slowing things down. <laughs> but right now we're in a period where even simple reforms can't get done. You know, things like reforming the tax code, reforming social security. Some smaller countries are a lot better at simple reforms. So some of the Scandinavian countries 
are, are out here and easy. It's easier to start a business in Denmark than it is to start a business in the United States. It's just a lot less permits you got to go through. They have very high taxes, which keeps down their overall GDP as well. So most of Europe is uh, 20 to 40 percent below the U.S. in GDP. Even some of it that's it's quite quite good at doing business. Oh, and I have the, I have the you know I put the frontier there. So this this graph uh, was um, 100 is observed and you know it's a, it, it's an index of, of of a lot of different things. Uh, you know the U.S. could move up to here, <laughs> and 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 be a hundred thousand dollars and. Uh, for even more, 120, uh, and, and I think that's what we should be aiming for. Great, um, and then I guess a lot of the more progressive people I know, you talk about how growth is just this driving factor, you know, all our policies should be to maximize growth. And I know people who are more progressive who would say, I'm just curious to hear what you think. Do you think there's ever a point we'll reach where growth is unsustainable, where unlimited growth isn't possible? or might not be the best thing for our economy? Or, or how would you respond to people who might say that? Uh, well, it depends on which parts you want. So GDP does leave out things like the environment, for example. So number one thing is, well, what about the environment? It turns out the US's air and water are cleaner than those of Europe and way cleaner than those of China, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, the environment is a luxury good. and. Um, people who are more prosperous, uh, you know, there's only so many cars and TVs you can have. W once you have central heating, car, TV, and decent medical, then, then you say, how about some medical care? And then as you start to earn more money, you say, how about some clean environment? So in fact, the surest way to a clean environment uh, is to get to, to let uh, the economy grow in other ways. Also, we are turning, um, so GDP is, is what people value. And we are turning from an economy of a manufacturing economy to a services economy, which is much lighter uh, on the environment. So in, in fact, if, if you could, if we could have um, innovation, strong competition led innovation in like nuclear power, <laughs> uh, we could have carbon free energy at very low cost that would allow us to desalinate water and solve that problem. Uh, so um, I think in fact, that is, Innovation, competition-led innovation is the solution to most of these social problems, uh, not uh, turning back the clock. Um, there's this dream of an agrarian past. It was awful <laughs> and, and, uh, and very polluting, as a matter of fact. So economically, are you saying that it's possible to continue kind of growing as a society um, until the end of time? Or is there ever a point we reach where we reached maximum growth? That's a good question. And that's so one of the big questions in economics right now. If you want to do economics, is growth over because growth is over? <laughs> or is growth over because we are tying ourselves up with red tape and regulations? Now, the fundamental, first of all, uh, everywhere else could join the US. <laughs> all of these poor countries could be like us. Um, and it, that, that doesn't involve using up a whole bunch of resources that we don't have. It, you know, uh, service oriented economies are, are not that. Most of this is about learning to do things better. So <clears throat> other countries could have the knowledge of our healthcare workers and be healthy uh, like us without burning up more fossil fuels. It's not about uh, using up more resources in that, in that sense. Um, now, the central question of growth is, are we running out of ideas? So where growth comes from fundamentally is better ideas. And better ideas includes better products how to do things with less energy and, and uh, work workers and, and resources. Uh, but it also includes how to run companies better. Um, so are we fundamentally running out of ideas is the essential question. And it, it may tail off, but uh, <clears throat> if growth tails off, nonetheless, it, it, it could tail off, <laughs> it could tail off down here and not tail off up there. And there's a long way that the US could go uh, to, uh, to uh, improve the quality of life for all of us. Um, I think there's a tendency for some of your progressive friends to have lived in uh, a great amount of privilege and therefore to say, well, I don't need any more. So those little poor people don't need any more either. Uh, they should go see what the lives of the poor people are like before deciding that, that we don't need uh, more stuff. But, but since so much is about knowledge and about services and, and, and not just about building stuff, um, I think there is plenty more to go before 
uh, resources and environment become a constraint on, on the things that we can produce that are of value to people, which isn't, isn't just stuff. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I think I'll pass on uh, to the next person. How are you? So Jewel and I kind of conjoined our questions because we saw we were running. You guys going to sing for us? <laughs> uh, not go today. On a, go on <laughs> well, then I won't either. <laughs> Come see Matilda. We still have one more weekend of our Christmas show. All right. The uh, the um, my dad teaches economics. He teaches uh, finance, and he, he's done adjunct. It's not he he enjoys teaching, but he runs our foundation and some other things as well. Um, so economics have always been important to us. And because of starting many of our own businesses, it's been something um, very real, but very, very practical. Now, studying our past history, um, you know, there's the rule of the law and the letter of the law. Our founding fathers lived at a time when they when the, it was a fledgling nation that wasn't guaranteed to succeed at all. And I don't think that looking back, if you look at something like Shays Rebellion, uh, Washington had the fear of the nation not existing anymore. But I'm sure that he, as we can look into his farewell address, that those are the choices that I don't think that they were confident in that they were right, but they were confident that that was the choice they wanted to make to make sure that the nation survived. And one th one issue I have when we look back in time at certain rights that were violated early on is assuming that they weren't just fearful that the country wasn't going to continue, period, and that they did have principles, but that doesn't mean that they always lived by them. So then we look to the way they acted and certain laws that they would that they passed or certain ways that they treated people. And then we looked at what they said. And then we assume that our laws were had the principles of all of their actions. So what I mean by that is, I think the founders had an idealistic principle of the right to property. But I think that at times they violated it. But moving forward, I do think that 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 right was meant to be enshrined in the Constitution. And that it can almost it can be read directly into it. And as more of an originalist, a natural law thinker, when you think about not having a direct amendment relating to the economy, for the way that we really think of it, it's like we, it, the personal liberty and economic liberty should never be separated. That the thought of having a right to like the, the, the farm we talked about, the wheat, um, the thought of the thought of the government being able to pass laws or, or anything like that, for a large portion of, of every of the founders who built this, certainly the anti-federalists, to think that the federal government had any power to do that was really foreign to them. Well, let me let me start by saluting the sophistication uh, of your thinking. I, I didn't know that uh, anyone under 40 had been through an educational system where you look at history as anything but morality plays where you judge people as yes or no by today's standards. And uh, you, you clearly have cottoned on to um, the sort of traditional but much more sophisticated cool. way of reading <laughs> history and trying to understand the problems that people faced at the time uh, in their context. Uh, it was a near miss. We, we, you are exactly right. People think the United States it was destined to come out okay. No, it was not destined to come out okay. And, and we just had one near miss after another. And uh, <clears throat> we're gonna go through some other near misses too that's in your hands <laughs> and all of our hands to not uh, to not mess up so that that attitude first of all is exactly right you are um right on so much more uh the delicate compromise of the constitution uh let's let's say it the compromise was about slavery and uh uh and the principles that were clear versus the practice that was not and the fact that if they tried to say well we're not going to do it they wouldn't have had a country uh, the first draft of the Declaration of Independence did say life, liberty, and private property, <laughs> as some of the other uh, uh, versions of that had, and they took it out. Now, <clears throat> um, it might be nice, uh, you know, for my fights with the Palo Alto Zoning Board, uh, if we had life, liberty, and private property in the Declaration. 
But on the other hand, uh, property at the time included human property, and that that had they put that in, that might have caused us worse, worse, even worse problems uh, than we had on the way out. But I want to just salute the last thing you said is so deep. It's, it's Milton Friedman's capitalism and freedom. <clears throat> uh, how can it's kind of funny that that the the right likes to talk about economic liberty and not so much personal liberty. The left talks like to talk about personal sexual liberty, but not economic liberty. But the two liberties are are intertwined. Uh, and if you cannot, I think it is deeply a fact. If you cannot have economic liberty, you cannot truly have political liberty uh, either. Uh, I'm for if the federal government can <clears throat> deny you the right to work, then they can control your political thought. So, for example, I worry about the E-Verify system. Do you know that everybody has to have a work permit in the United States? The federal government can deny you the permission to work if they think that you're a, a, a not committed alien. Well, so we have a system where the whole federal government can stop you from working, and that system's getting getting stronger. And with cryptocurrency, the federal government will watch every transaction you've made. If you can't have some transaction that the federal government doesn't watch, you're and that's the way it works in China. You step out, you lose your job. People don't step out of line. So personal and economic liberty are, I think. Uh, political liberty, personal liberty, and economic liberty are are deeply intertwined, um, and that's uh, that's I I think that's true. You think that's true, and uh, if we, most of the rest of our citizens, fellow citizens don't. <laughs> if we if today we would probably need an amendment, but it would be redundant in my thinking because because of everything that I said and what you said. Um, but when you think about something it, it, like zoning previous permits, round of Supreme Court, uh, uh, so until the 1930s, the Supreme Court held that in fact you had a right to privacy in your transactions, a right to contract. Uh, or I, if, you know, I want to sell you an apple. You want to give me two dollars? That's our business, not the government's business. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, that was there. You know, the Constitution was set in enforced to uh, stop tyranny. A lot of those tyrannies were economic tyr tyrannies. You know, the Boston Tea Party was about a tax <laughs> and about uh, about the English government telling people what they could buy and what they, they, they had enforced monopolies. They weren't allowed to trade with countries the way they wanted to trade. So there was a lot of economic liberty in it. And a lot of scholarship reads the constitution as it used to read the constitution as guaranteeing economic liberties. Well, that changed with the New Deal cases in the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, so, uh, and you're right. You, you, um, just having an amendment isn't enough. You have to believe in it. <laughs> if we did, and then just one one more quick thing. Um, you mentioned Milton Friedman, and <clears throat> definitely a big Milton Friedman and Thomas Sowell fan, and some others like that. Uh, I think it's much much more interesting. And if we could, if you could talk to individuals about it, it's what they believe in their personal life. Because anyone I know that wants to go cut down a tree can't believe that they have to have a level of business insurance, work permits, and 10 other things before they can go do someone's yard work. And they don't really believe that that's how, that, that their kids shouldn't be able to go next door and shovel, the, shovel their neighbor's lawn, but yet they vote for people that actually do restrict that. Um, there's some new, there's new terms going on in economics. And I don't know if you've heard like transitory inflation and and uh, and we should and we can just say how that money will always have a certain value and then it will have that value. So we don't need to worry about inflation. Um, what would be your one what would be your one minute, I guess, pitch to say to people um, that you don't that that's not, not true no. or that's not going to work or if we go down that path, we're probably going to fall into a terrible control economy. Uh, yeah, the control economy comes when people, when the government reacts to inflation by fixing prices, <laughs> and, and then that goes downhill after that. Um, in, inflation, so Decom 101, inflation is, is, you have to make the distinction between one price going up and another going down versus inflation when all prices and wages uh, go up together. And my one minute on that will be inflation comes when the government prints up debt that people don't believe it can, it was going to pay back, and uh, that's why I think we're on the edge. Uh, we're, we're on the edge of a dangerous uh, inflation. Okay, but we have a lot of audience questions. Yeah, and we do. Not a lot of time. Yeah. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, thank you, Jewel and Jordan. That actually goes into one of our audience questions from a member of our board, Jay McConville. And Jay says, a current argument is that government intervention stimulates the economy by putting money into the hands of more people who then spend it creating business. Supposedly, without this money, we not move as freely in the economy. This has been used recently to defend the stimulus and extended unemployment benefits. What are your thoughts on that? So my first thought is, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to graph number one. Is the only reason that we're at 60,000 and they used, they used to be at 2,000, but the government didn't think of the idea of printing up money and handing it out to people to stoke demand. <laughs> Obviously not, right? In fact, they had a huge inflation in the 1790s because the government printed up uh, too much money and, and that ran into supply. Uh, so, so fundamentally, um, demand can be about pushing these twiddles around at best, but uh, the fundamentally, <clears throat> the economy, and especially once we hit inflation, uh, once you hit inflation, prosperity only comes from <clears throat> allowing the economy to work more efficiently. Uh, <clears throat> allow you know all the regulations that stop the truck drivers from driving the trucks from place to place, and all the rules that that keep people from becoming truck drivers to go and, and drive trucks from place to place. Uh, we once we hit inflation, that demand story is clearly over, and all it was ever about possibly was slowing down these little twiddles, uh, whereas the supply and growth side of the economy is where, where the long-term action is. Okay. Um, and then Jonathan Nash wanted to go back to the Constitution just for a second. Uh, he said, you mentioned the Constitution addressed some individual economic rights. Did the Constitution dictate anything around federal economic policy and control, anything pertaining to the gold standard or the Federal Reserve's role in controlling inflation? And if not, what initiated those controls? Oh God, a history of monetary policy. Let's see. <laughs> the constitution did give the government, the central government, the only right to foreign trade. And in fact, we had huge tariffs throughout the 19th century. <clears throat> I think very unwisely, but certainly constitutionally. It's another example of things, things that are constitutional aren't always wise. Uh, in fact, the, um, in the uh, <clears throat> when Roosevelt went off the gold standard, uh, he defaulted. There was gold clauses in the debt. He defaulted on them. The Supreme Court said, "Well, that's not a great idea, but you're allowed to do it. You're allowed to default on the debt. The federal government is allowed to default on the debt." The Constitution established that uh, Congress can 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 determine coinage, can determine the value of the dollar, but otherwise, it's fairly silent on on monetary issues. And <clears throat> we've had debates throughout the history of our country. Uh, which are both legal debates, but not really constitutional debates. Uh, are, we had no central bank until 1914. Our central bank was put in place in response to financial crisis, but uh, really money was in was part of the treasury uh, throughout uh, through 1914 and even into the 1930s. So the idea that the Federal Reserve is in charge of uh, money inflation is really only a post-war idea. So um, it's lots to talk about. I think we, I need to come back and do a, a, a inflation and financial affairs as opposed to a growth because there's lots to talk about on that. But I don't think um, this deeply constitutional issue. Now there's deep legal issues. Right now, the Federal Reserve is going past its legal mandate of inflation and employment and taking on climate change, inequality, and racism. Uh, and um, it, it's, it wants to start telling banks you may not lend to fossil fuel companies in the name of fossil uh, climate change, uh, which is uh, an interesting uh, authority for the central bank to do on its own without uh, the legislation. Congress can do that. Congress can say, oh, nobody can lend to a fossil fuel company they want to. But central banks are taking that up on their own. So there's very interesting legal issues about and policy issues about where central banks are going uh, and what's going to happen to our money. Are we going to have a big inflation? Should we have something like a gold standard? How could we implement something like that that works in a modern uh, day? Should we allow cryptocurrency? Should we allow central bank digital currency? All sorts of interesting questions, legal as well as economic, but I don't think really constitutional. Well, and I see we're right at three, and I know you have to, to leave us at three, and we had some other great audience questions. We're very sorry we didn't get to, but, but hope we invite everybody in our audience to come back uh, for our next show, and hopefully we can get some more of these questions answered. But um, John, thank you so much for being with us today. Janine, uh, any parting words before John has to leave? Uh, no, I just this was terrific, John. Uh, everyone should check out your, is it grumpy economist dot 
the grumpy, if you just Google the grumpy economist, you will find me. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, I thought you were very jolly. I didn't think you were grumpy at all. Um, and I thank you for, for all of your information today because it was vast and uh, most informative and a little bit depressing. <laughs> Bob, a little bit grumpy. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your great, great questions. Uh, really, oh, did really sharp, really helpful. We have a great group of, of, of a great, great panel here. It's really fun. It's always fun to hear everyone's different take and how they ask their questions in different ways. And um, so thank you so much, John. We appreciate you. We appreciate our audience today. Come back for the Wealth of Nations is next week, I believe. We're going to talk about uh, John, uh, Adam Smith. So that will be really, really terrific. And uh, check out the entire series that we have online at constitutionamerica.org because it's i'm really enjoying these series we get to learn so much and john cochran i hope you'll come back because we you. need you all right thank you to the panel as well jewel and jordan thank tova it's aubrey kathy and you there jewel and jordan always such deep and deep questions deep questions they have yes so thank you jewel and jordan okay everyone is want to say goodbye anybody else i guess not okay all right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, Aubrey, you can say goodbye. You're you're like with us still. Yeah, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for joining <laughs> us today, everyone. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye.